Hey Internet, welcome to La Vida Lambda. My name is Jonathan, and in today's episode, we're going to be talking about sort of a neat little project I've been working on for the last little while. Not so much for the project itself, but for the process by which it was developed. Now, before we get into the nitty gritty of the project, I want to talk a little bit about some, some background on how it came into being. Now, my father is a huge Habs fan, and back in 1985, he wrote a a program called MTL Stats, and uh, what MTL Stats does is it allows him to track um, hockey statistics for his favorite team, um, and he's able to to record these statistics and to, to accumulate a database of, of, of all of this this um, this statistical game information. Um, and he's been doing this for thirty some odd years now. As you might imagine, over the years, he's had to modify it a few times to, so that it will run on a modern system. Uh, and a couple of years back, he ran into a problem where it just wouldn't print anymore. So he, he tried a number of things. He wasn't able to come up with a solution. So what he decided he was going to do was that he was going to rewrite it entirely from scratch in a modern programming language so that it will run on a modern system. Unfortunately, what he found was that he didn't have the time to learn a new programming language because, you know, he's got things to do and the, the, the statistics tracking itself is, is, quite, um, is quite the endeavor as it, as it stands. So uh, what he ended up doing was he, he commissioned me to, to write the software for him. Now, I don't know anything about hockey. I mean, I know the general concept that you want to get the puck in the other guy's net more often than they get the puck in yours. That's, that's about all I know about it. Despite having grown up surrounded by it, I just it just never really clicked with me. But the project was interesting. So I asked him if he had any preferences about what language he wants it written in, because I mean, it's his project and he didn't care. He said, I just, I don't, I don't care as long as it runs. I want it to run. No. I, I just want it to run. So obviously I picked Haskell because Haskell is my favorite language. There are lots of reasons for that. Um, I'm not gonna get into all of those here. That's probably the subject for another video, but that suffice it to say that's what I chose. Now, because he had been using the software for so long, he didn't want it to change a whole lot in terms of, in terms of the user experience because he wanted, he was familiar with it. He didn't, he didn't want like something entirely different. He just wanted to track his statistics the way he had always been doing, and he just wanted it to work. So um, we decided uh, early on that we would go with just a basic ASCII text interface because the original program was that. Um, and so I, I figured, oh, okay, that's, that's not a problem. That's, ASCII text is really easy. Now, the first kind of major hurdle that we ran into was the fact that it would use standard input, standard output, like any other text-based program, but the original program did certain things like clear the screen, move the cursor on the screen, uh, eventually down the road you wanted to be able to add color and sound to it, um, which we haven't gotten into yet, but that's, that's coming. And um, so first I decided that I would look at um, a library called Brick, because I've used Brick before. It's it's really great. It's it's really sort of abstracted. Uh, it's got a really nice abstract interface that lets you think of things in sort of functional terms, the way the way Haskell kind of is, uh, and it's really really nice. But unfortunately, what I discovered is since my father runs Windows and I run Linux, um, Brick doesn't compile. Um, Brick isn't supported on Windows, or Brick doesn't support the Windows operating system. So I couldn't use it because while well, I could make the program, it wouldn't run on a system that completely defeats the whole point of the project. So I had to find something different. So what I found was that in the Hackage repository, there was a, a, a Haskell wrapper around the NCurses library, which was written in C in the 80s or 90s, I don't, I'm not sure. And it's, it's, it's kind of old, but it's still there, it's supported. Um, so I decided I would build this program on top of that. Now the problem with this is that um, NCurses is kind of old and uh, was designed really to be used in C, which is an imperative 
uh, programming language rather than a functional programming language like Haskell. So and it and it really feels like an imperative kind of type of library. So I, what I decided I would do is I was going to build kind of a brick-like architecture um, to sit between. Uh, to sit between the end cursors library and the program that I was writing and and have that handle talking to the end cursors library and, and and have that working so because this program was written to run on a TRS-80 the the memory requirements aren't really very intense I mean it's expanded a little bit beyond that but not a great deal um, it doesn't store huge, huge amounts of data. Uh, mostly, what it does is it, it prints out a report for every game, and then a lot of the a lot of the information is is then discarded. So there's not a lot of persistent information that we need to keep. Um, there's a list of players and their stats for the current year and over their lifetime. There's game standings, and that's about it, um, database wise. So it's not a really big database that we need to keep. Um, so I decided that the best way to handle this, the easiest way to handle this, um, especially working within a functional language, was that I would just store the entire contents of the database as a JSON blob on disk. Um, so when the program starts up, it slurps up the information from this JSON file, uh, loads it into memory, and then works with, with all the data just in RAM. And then when it's done at the end of the session, it just it just dumps all this information back into the, the JSON file and it's it's ready to go for the next time you pick up the program. So we're gonna look a little bit at how this works. Alright, so here we have the main module for MTL stats. Every Haskell program is expected to have a main module, and that main module is expected to have a main function. That function is what is executed when your program is run. So let's scroll down to our main function here. And you'll see that it's actually quite simple. There's not a lot to it. Um, the first thing that we'll notice is this run curses function. Run curses is supplied by the wrapper around the end curses library. The reason it exists is this. An end curses program has an initialization function that is supposed to be called at the beginning of the program, which sets all the memory up and, and so forth. Uh, it also has a, a teardown function that gets called at the end. Um, the way that the, this Haskell wrapper around in curses keeps you from forgetting to do those is it makes all of the uh, all of the end curses functions themselves instead of being standard Haskell I/O functions, it makes them this custom curses type, which can only be called by running them through run curses, and run curses automatically calls the setup and teardown functions for you, so that you don't have to remember to run them, so that it's it's physically impossible to call them without doing this, which is kind of nice. Um, now, our program is built around a something called a state transformer. It's found in the transformers package on Hackage. So since Haskell is a functional language, it doesn't allow for mutable variables. It actually does, but only in certain special cases. And a state transformer allows us to write programs sort of pretending that we're working in an imperative language because that's, it's kind of helpful to be able to think in those terms, even though the code is still purely functional. Um, so what we're doing here is we're calling this init state function, which, uh, which I have written, which basically just loads up the program and it pulls in the database and loads the database as, as we talked about earlier, um, and then sticks that database into the program state and then passes that initial program state into this eval state t function. Now, eval state t is supplied by the transformers library. It um, <clears throat> evaluates a uh, it evaluates a state transformer given an initial state. So we're passing this main loop function into eval state, and we're giving it our init state or our initial state that uh, that we've generated here. So moving on to our main loop, um, we see that main loop is of type action. That's actually that's actually a custom type that I've defined. The actual definition of it looks like this. Um, 
<clears throat> it's it's basically just a um, a state transformer that that uses this prog state value that we've defined down here. Prog state just contains the program state. Um, so it uses prog state as its state value and then it generates a one of these custom curses um, actions based on that. So the main loop then functions as follows. So it calls the dispatch function on the program state to figure out what controller we're running. Um, a controller is also a custom data type that I have written. And it really just consists of two functions. This draw controller function, which takes, which takes the program state and creates a uh, window updater that also returns a cursor mode because sometimes uh, we want the cursor to be visible, sometimes we don't. So what this what this draw controller function does is it, it looks at the program state and it creates a function to draw the screen based on that and decide whether the cursor is visible or not. It also has a it also has this handle controller function which is an event handler that takes an event as its input, event is defined in the curses library. All of these C dot names are defined in the curses, in the end curses library. And it produces an action that returns a Boolean type. The Boolean is true if the main loop should run again and it's false if the program is done running. So as soon as an action returns falls, the program is going to stop and then the curses cleanup functions are going to get called and, and the program exits. <clears throat> so <clears throat> we've re we have retrieved the controller from the dispatcher and we've passed it into this C value. The next thing that we are going to do is that we are going to get the the draw controller function from our controller value and we're going to draw it. This lift function here just makes it a state transformer instead of a curses action. The next thing we're going to do is we're going to get the default window. Now curses allows us to manage multiple windows. I've chosen not to deal with any of that in this instance. Um, because it just makes things too complicated. And I didn't want to be too dependent on the library. And then we pass the result into this W value. So let's look at this next line, which again is a little bit intimidating looking, but we'll break it down here. So we're getting the next event from curses. This is typically going to be triggered when the user presses a key on the keyboard or the screen gets resized or something like that. So it generates an event. The nothing here tells the get event function that there is no time limit on how long we're willing to wait for an event to happen. It just locks the program. It just halts execution of the program until an event is retrieved. The return result of this function is going to be a maybe event, which means maybe we're going to get an event, maybe we're not. Because we're waiting as long as it takes, we know an event is going to come out of here. So this from just function tells the compiler, yeah, there's totally going to be a value in here. It's not going to be nothing. There's going to be something. If this function were to return a nothing, our program would crash. But in this case, we can be fairly certain that that's not going to happen. So as much as I don't like to use from just in here, it's fairly justified. It then passes this event into the event handler for our controller. So we pass the result of this to when m, which looks at the resulting Boolean that comes out, whether it's true or false. And if it's true, it calls the main loop again. Otherwise, the program exits.
So again, the general breakdown of this function, just to recap, is it looks at the program state to figure out what controller we're using. It calls the draw controller function on that controller to draw whatever's supposed to be on the screen based on whatever the program state is. And then it waits for an event and passes that event to the controller's event handler. And if the result is true, it calls the main loop again, otherwise it terminates. So it's actually a fairly simple main loop that we have here. Now, NCurses is a very low level library, which means that we don't have a lot of these convenient um, input output functions that, uh, that we have in other languages. It's just, it's just very basic control of the terminal. So move the cursor to this line, change to this color, et cetera, et cetera. So it doesn't have functions that you would expect to find in, in a lot of libraries, like for instance, fetch a string from the user. Um, it just, it doesn't have a prompt. It doesn't have any kind of, uh, any kind of user prompts built into it that I'm aware of anyway. So I ended up having to implement my own. So an interesting consequence of that is that since I was having to implement all of these functions for myself that you would expect to already be there, I was able to kind of really tailor them to the project for instance, um, when, uh, when my father would use his old program, he would have his caps lock key turned on all the time because most of the input that he was doing was in uppercase characters. So what I was able to do was I was able to write uh, a prompt function that uh, takes that when a key is pressed, um, it looks at the, the character that was brought in, and if it's a lowercase, it can say, okay, we actually want this to be uppercase, effectively creating sort of a virtual caps lock right in the program. So, so stuff that he wants to be forced to uppercase just automatically gets converted to uppercase. Um, later on, we, we came to a uh, one spot in the program where he would enter a, 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 player, a player's name, and he wanted it written in the format where it was last name, comma, first name, and the last name was in all caps, and then the first name was capitalized the way a name would typically be capitalized. So I wrote kind of a custom function to, to get input from the user that would, that would lock all the characters to uppercase until it saw a comma, and then it would lock the next uh, it would lock the next character that wasn't a space to uppercase, and then after that, it would just let it would just pass the characters through as normal. So you could you could have um, it, you could just type the name without having to worry about shift or caps lock or anything, and it would just capitalize properly in probably ninety five percent of cases, and that was really cool. Another thing that uh, that I ended up doing was I created a sort of a player search function because when you're 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 telling the program what player um, scored such and such a goal, what player got this penalty, what what player we want to edit, what player we want to look at the stats for, etc. Um, in the old program, uh, when he would enter a player, he would have to type the player's entire name. So I, I created a custom function because the logic is working one by interpreting one keystroke event at a time, um, it would update the screen so that as you're entering a player's name, it would be looking up in the database, what players do I have that sort of match this string? What, what players that have this, this, this sort of string of characters that's being entered in their name? And it would present them underneath the prompt as a list of sort of autocomplete options. Uh, so you could press F1, F2, F3, and you could, you could press the corresponding function key to select that player. So you don't have to type a player's whole name, which can be really tedious and error prone. Um, so we eliminated that and that was that was actually pretty cool. So yeah, all in all, it's been an interesting project so far. It's it's still not um, it's not it's still not completed, um, but I will have uh, links to the source code down in the description so you can follow along with the project, see how it's going. Um, also, if you'd like to see more videos like this, um, feel free to uh, comment, subscribe, that sort of thing, um, and you know just uh, just let me know. Thanks for watching. Have a great day.